Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. There are several points in the semester when I always feel that things get noticeably weirder, and this is another one of those points. So let's get weird. What I want to start with is asking you what can and can't be kin. And we're going to move from obvious candidates for kinship, like other people, I certainly hope other people can be kin, sort of outwards to perhaps less obvious examples. And I want you to just think about these. I want you to think about myth, tradition, religion, um, practices across all kinds of cultures, and whether or not these things can be things that you're related to. So moving away from other people, let's look at animals. We can consider perhaps domestic pets of all kinds. Are those kin? I'm pretty sure my cats are kin. I talked about this at the beginning of the semester. We can look at animals that act in concert with humans that we use to do tasks with, that we work together with, like dogs, horses, donkeys, camels. There are also animals who enable human subsistence. If sharing food can be part of kinship, are cattle, sheep, and goats maybe kin in a way? I also wonder about animals that have powerful symbolic meaning. Can you be kin to an eagle or a snake or a bear? These were just the first few animals that popped into my head when I was thinking about symbolic animals, but feel free to substitute your own. Let's also think about plants. Those of you who took Introduction to Linguistic Anthropology with me will be familiar with the idea of plants as kin as well. So consider plants that enable human subsistence, like wheat, rice, rye, potatoes, cabbage, or plants with medicinal powers that strengthen our bodies, like juniper, mojavelnik, uh, eucalyptus, chamomile, romashka, um, and chaga. Plants with maybe magical powers, like adraspan or sage, shelfe. Moving outwards again, spirits. Maybe you don't believe in spirits, but lots of people do, and lots of people have throughout history, so you don't have to believe in spirits, but consider the array of beliefs out there. Can ghosts or ancestors be kin? Um, the idea that ancestors are kin and that you can have ongoing relationships with deceased ancestors is pretty common worldwide. Or perhaps divine spirits like angels or demons or deities. Certainly classical Greek and Roman myth is filled with examples of deities coming down to earth and getting it on and having children with mortals. So certainly people have imagined that one too. Um, maybe other supernatural entities like elemental spirits or the spirits of particular places or deities associated with your particular clan or lineage. And finally, I want to ask you about various inanimate objects. Maybe natural objects like rocks, mountains, rivers, or lakes. I once lived on the shore of a lake in Japan that is often called the Mother Lake, Lake Biwa. Maybe everyday tools that can feel, I don't know, maybe not like kin, but like part of you. Kitchen tools if you like to cook, work tools, your phone prosthetics that again maybe are part of you but are maybe also kin um, from glasses, walking sticks, wheelchairs, artificial limbs, notebooks which are memory prosthetics, also your phone that's my primary memory prosthetic. And the key questions that I want to raise here are what are the limits between self and other, between different people and between people and objects? And what is mutual being? and what things get to share in mutual being with humans. This article is more of an exercise in asking what if. It has some data and some examples, but it wants to use these examples not so much to 
show anything super concrete, but rather to ask us about possibilities. So what can we learn from the way that various encounters with medical systems, medical treatments, medical technology, um, and people in the medical system, how can that help us reconceptualize what is kin? How can technology both make kinship relationships and also be kin to us? How can technology be family? And Wolf Meyer specifically wants us to think about uh, the world as full of inorganic and organic kin. And what makes all of these things kin is that we have relations with them and through them. And in fact, that perhaps kinship itself is a kind of technology that we use to extend relationships. We have relations and we use kinship to extend relations. And so such a view, he argues, would build on substantialist conceptions of kinship, where kinship is reckoned through sharing some kind of substance like food, semen, or breast milk. And maybe the shared substance doesn't have to be organic. Maybe it doesn't have to be blood. Maybe it can be technology. Wolfmeyer gives us four medical procedures as case studies to show how this might work. The first is fecal microbial transplants, which are admittedly gross and which Wolfmeyer describes in detail, so I will leave you to his description. These transplants can cure some gastrointestinal diseases or they can be used as repeated therapy for some unpleasant gastrointestinal symptoms. And what happens is that the person receiving the transplant is colonized by healthy gut bacteria. And what people who undergo this procedure come to understand is that not just is their like, stomach being colonized, but that the body of the donor seems to colonize them in other ways, that through this procedure, we imagine our bodies to be connected to other bodies, and we imagine our bodies to be like those donor bodies in some way. Donor and recipient share part of their existence through microbial exchange. And therefore, in order to have a comfortable experience with this procedure, um, recipients can believe that it's really important to find somebody who is already as like them as possible. Otherwise, your body might begin to feel like it's not your own. Wolfmeyer's other major example is facilitated communication. Um, and this is for people who are unable to speak for whatever reason. Um, autism is the, the specific case that he's looking at most in depth. But people who are unable to speak for whatever reason can sometimes be physically assisted in the use of communication devices, which might include typewriters, simplified keyboards, other devices. Caregivers can literally help People lift their arms and manipulate these devices if they have difficulty. Moreover, caregivers who are used to interacting with other people through these devices can help interpret the language that is produced for outsiders. And his main example for this is actually a text that is co-produced by an autistic woman communicating with assisted devices and the woman who primarily assists her. But this relationship raises some questions. As two people communicate basically as one, what happens to the boundaries between people and the boundaries between people and machines? Who is communicating? Is it just 
the nonverbal person? Is it the nonverbal person plus the machine? Or is it the nonverbal person and their caregiver and their machine? And how does this ability to communicate more broadly as a result of facilitated communication expand the relationship making capacities of nonverbal people? The third example is that of machines to assist in cases of sleep apnea. I don't know if you've encountered this before. Um, these are prescribed to people who snore quite badly um, because during sleep, um, the reason that they snore is that their airways close, which means you can die in your sleep. That's super scary, right? Um, so there are these machines that have grown more comfortable um, and easier to use over the years that, um, you know, sit on your table by the bed and have a little tube and you have like a little mouthpiece and you sleep with that on and it helps you not die in your sleep because your airways close. These machines can be kind of members of the family. They're, they're company in bed. Um, they have to be introduced to bed partners, as Wolf Meyer tells us. They have to be cared for. They have to be regularly cleaned and maintained and turned on. You settle into bed with them. So perhaps a sleep apnea machine can be kin. And finally, he looks at genetic ancestry testing. Um, this is something that is super popular in the U.S. right now. Um, I don't know if it's available here, but you can get your genes tested commercially now to look both for um, potential medical conditions as well as um, to compare your genes to the genetics of certain other populations in order to determine who you might be related to or what people you might come from. And so what this does, according to Wolfmeyer, is it opens up a bundle of relations to people whose bodies are like yours because you share genes in some way. Um, and this could be because you share racial and ethnic genetic markers, because you share hereditary disease genes. Either way, there is quite literally a shared substance, right? And it's not blood, it's, it's genes. Wolfmeyer says, across these examples, my attention is on how technology serves to create connections between individuals and how, in some cases, caring for technology, especially in the case of assisted communication or the sleep apnea machines, caring for technology serves as a primary means to connect individuals with wider relations, transcending usual concepts of kin to radically expanded networks of people and objects. All right, so some thoughts to end on. Is any kind of technology ever neutral? We imagine that a lot of technology just transmits information, but does it? Is it? Is it that simple? Does your phone just transmit information or does it shape the form that the information takes in the first place. And what happens when people become technology? Again, is that boundary really there? Wolfmeyer also suggests that caring about and mutuality of being is more than what a kinship chart can tell you, but rather it's an interaction between bodies that recomposes them in fundamental ways. When you see a kinship chart, you see relationships between discrete individuals. But Wolf Meyer is actually asking, where are the boundaries between people? Do relationships transform us and connect us with people in ways that make us actually not totally distinct from each other? Does it merge us with other people? And finally, since you've all made kinship charts now, in what way are kinship charts their own kind of technology and are they neutral? Thank you so much for sticking with me and I will talk to you next time. Looking forward to your answers.